complete. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the half. And wow, what a half it's been. I guarantee you nobody saw this coming as the team does not look like themselves. They started off strong, but just couldn't keep up. They may have had a strategy coming in, but it's obviously not working. But there's plenty of time to turn things around. It's only halftime. You just hope a new team comes out after the half with a better plan. So it's back to the drawing board if they want to have a chance of coming away with a victory. The head coach needs to make some adjustments and make them fast because they are not on the same page. And we'll get back to the action after halftime. Well, as we begin this series, uh, on behalf of all of us at Gwinnett Church, I want to say hey to Decatur City Church. So thrilled with what's happening, especially these last six months for you guys. Southside Church, you've just opened up. I think you may have opened up another campus since we've started this morning. You have a campus in Peachtree City, Noonan, and Henry County. Way to go. And then Redstone Church in Birmingham. Looking forward to being with you guys in October. And Gwinnett Church, Hamilton Mill, Gwinnett Church, Sugar Hill. I'm so excited about this series and where we're going to be for the next three Sundays. Now, today, to begin, I'm gonna do something I thought I would never do. I'm gonna say something I would not thought I would never say. Some of you are gonna love this. Some of you won't like this. I'm not even sure I'm going to like this, but I'm going to begin today because this is a really a helpful illustration for what we're talking about this, in this series. I'm gonna begin today highlighting the University of Alabama and their head coach, Nick Saban, okay? So I know that kind of divides the crowd. Okay, hang with me. I'm a University of Georgia graduate. I'm a part of Bulldog Nation. That's one thing, okay? And the other thing about this example, it's gonna get even more painful if you're a Georgia Bulldog. Not only that, my wife is an Auburn graduate, so Auburn and Alabama may be the most fierce rivalry in all of sports. So as I begin the series today, talking about Nick Saban, I'm pretty convinced I'm gonna be sleeping on the couch later tonight, okay? So I understand all that, but but. Hang with me, especially if you're a Georgia Bulldog fan, because this story takes place not too far from here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium in January of 2018. Georgia was playing Alabama in the national... Yeah, I'm already hearing some groans from the Georgia fans. I, I'm with you. I was actually there at the game with my son, Cole, and it's halftime, and we're thinking Georgia's gonna win their first national championship since 1980. Because I even think the Alabama fans, you would agree that Georgia pretty much dominated that first half. And so we're just one half away from winning a national championship. But something happens at halftime. Something happens, and this illustration is where we're going today. Coach Nick Saban makes one of the most legendary halftime adjustments of all time. He goes to his starting quarterback, Jalen Hurts, who hasn't just had a pretty good season, he's had a fantastic season. He's actually the Southeastern Conference Offensive Player of the Year, okay? But he goes to Jalen and says, you're not playing the second half. He goes to a backup quarterback, to a tunnel of Viola, and says, you haven't really played much. You've not played any meaningful minutes this year. You're gonna start the second half of the national championship game. That Halftime adjustment took a lot of courage. It took a lot of things that we're gonna talk about today. And what happens is, is Tua goes in and he changes the complexion of the game, changes the momentum. Alabama goes on, pulls the game into overtime and Tua throws the winning touchdown pass. Alabama wins their 17th national championship, proving once again that we live in a fallen world where sin <laughs> abounds, okay? <laughs> Just have to get that out as a Georgia fan, all right? Now, that said, I wanna give props to Coach Saban. That took a lot of courage, all right? I was talking to a friend of mine who's a huge Alabama fan, graduated there, and he goes, well, you know, good luck telling this story, but in all due respect and fairness, the same thing happened to Alabama this season before because Clemson's coach, Dabo Swinney, went into halftime, made a halftime adjustment, and they go on to win the national championship. So the point is, is this idea of a halftime is really, really important. And when it comes to halftime, there's really basically five movements, five parts to a halftime. There's, there's the refuel, that's why we have the Gatorade up here, you kind of refuel and recharge. Then you reflect on what happened in the first half. You had a game plan going into the first half, you reflect on that game plan. Then, based on that, you assess where you may want to make some changes. Then, based on that, you actually decide to make the changes and adjust. Then you get everybody together and you have an inspiring speech and you go out to pursue what happens in the second half. Now, the reason this is important isn't just because of it's important for sports teams. The reason I bring this up is this is highly relevant and highly applicable to where you and I find ourselves in July. I mean, we find ourselves at halftime. 
We are in the middle part of the year. We've gone through the first half, and here we are about on the verge of going through the second half. And before we go any further into this year, I think it's helpful, just like a sports team, to pause and have a halftime. And to do that, what we're gonna do today in the next couple of weeks, we're actually gonna walk through a halftime. We're gonna walk through the next three Sundays gathering together and we're gonna give you some things to do throughout the week so that we are prepared for what God might have for us in the second half of the year. Now to do that, I'm gonna ask you a question, all right? And this question doesn't, I don't wanna guilt anyone. I don't wanna, this isn't a shameful question in any, any sense. I think it's a helpful question as it relates to reflect, all right? So to do that, before we talk about the second half, we've gotta pause and look back on the first half. And so the question I wanna begin our series with is simply this, and it's this question, remember January. Remember January coming into the year, maybe we had a plan and maybe we had goals and maybe this was gonna be our year. This is gonna be 2019 or this year is gonna be better than last year. This is gonna be our year. We're so excited and we're, you know, here we're headed into a new year and there's so much hope and so much vision and I love that. I love that time of year. And whether you're a goal setter or not, January is a really, I think, helpful reset, refresh to think, what would I want to do differently? What kind of change would I wanna have in the new year? Now, interesting thing about goal setters and non-goal setters. You know what happens between goal setters and non-goal setters? They get married. And that has an interesting dynamic. That creates an interesting dynamic. I, 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 I live that, I'm the goal setter and Wendy's the fun one in our marriage, okay? So whether you're a goal setter or not, January though, it is kind of a refresh, reset. So this past January, for, for some of our churches, we did a series called Better, How to Make This Year Better Than Last Year. And we showed you an illustration that I think could help us understand the potential and sometimes the challenges of bringing lasting change into our lives. So what I wanna do, I wanna revisit that illustration as we are in halftime of this year. In that illustration were these marbles. And what we said is that this in January represented the 365, these, these marbles represented the 365 days potentially that we will be given in the new year. And then we said, let's pick one area. It could be a relationship to improve. It could be finances to improve. It could be something about our health, whatever it might be, a goal, a business goal, that we would take one step every single day. And we talked about the power of consistency, that a small step positively every single day eventually winds up to be a really big deal. And what happens is, let's just take working out in December, right? We ate all the holiday food and we didn't exercise because we were, you know, had all the holiday parties and everything. And so in January, we get so fired up. So what we want to do, we're going to dump all the marbles into one three-hour workout, right? And we know intuitively that doesn't work. What works is one daily positive invite and, and, and step of change, one consistent step of change day in and day out. And we said our goal when we get to the end of the year, here's what we want the end of the year in that particular change of trying to create positive steps day in and day out. And we talked about how God could help us do that in January. When we get to December, here's what we want December to look like. We want a lot of marbles on this side to reflect the consistent steps that we made in the year. And if we can have our year to look like this, then chances are very realistically that we will see the change that we are wanting to bring into the new year. So some of our churches, we gave you marbles. Many of you have shown me pictures of what you've done with these in, in your home. Uh, a friend of mine told me that he did cotton balls instead of marbles. And I said, why did you do cotton balls? And he said, well, the cotton balls fill this up a lot faster than the marbles, okay? I'm like, all right, that's cool. Now, again, this isn't, this isn't a, how many marbles do you have on this side? It's not to guilt or shame anyone. What we're here to do is to pause and actually reflect. So what's the, what's the year looking like so far in terms of these consistent changes? And the reality is, my hunch is that if you came into the new year wanting to do this, you hit some resistance because that always happens when we wanna bring change into our lives. At some point, we hit resistance. And that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. That actually shows you're doing something right because change doesn't come easily. And we talked about how to create that change at the first of the year. But if you had some plans and if you, were not, you and I were to have a conversation and you would say, Jeff, I don't have as many marbles on this side in January as I would have thought or hoped for. I wanna share, share something with you that I think is a reality and maybe some hopeful news. It's definitely a reality. 
But, but I love this quote from the former heavyweight boxing champion of the world when he talks about the plans in our lives. He says this, he says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I love this. Like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I've got a great plan to be the heavyweight champion of the world until I get punched in the face. And the reason I bring this up is my hunches, you don't have to raise your hand, but my hunch is you could tell a story today, like I could tell a story today, how life punched you in the face, how life pushed you down and said to you in some form or fashion, you don't get up, stay there. And at some point when life punches us in the face, at some point when we get pushed down, it could be through a lot of different situations and circumstances. At some point, we just realize, or, or not realize, we, we begin to think, I don't think I'm gonna be able to put this change over here because life has told you to stay down. And here's what I wanna share with you in this series. And forget about me. Here's what I think your heavenly father wants to share with you. And when it comes to July, when it comes to the mid-year point, and if you've kind of given up on those hopes, you've kind of given up on those January dreams and visions, here's what I want you to know. The cool thing about July, it's only halftime. It's not too late to finish strong. It's not too late to finish strong. And what we wanna do as a collection of churches over the next three Sundays before the school season starts and before we get back into the busyness and the chaos of the second half of the year, we wanna call a time out, get together and do this. We wanna refuel, re-energize those dreams. We wanna reflect, hey, what went well, what didn't go well. We wanna assess, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Then we wanna adjust our plans and then we want our heavenly father to inspire us and we wanna strengthen and inspire ourselves. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is about King David when he was going through a lot of different challenges and the Bible says that he strengthened himself. For some of us, maybe all of us today, in some form or fashion, we need to strengthen ourselves for the journey ahead. Now to do this, here's where we're gonna go this week. I'm gonna give you four halftime questions. And these questions, I think, will be very helpful. They'll be challenging. And I, the reason I say that is I've already done these, all right? So I went first. I'm gonna invite you to invite a group of people around you to maybe help you process this questions, these questions, and I'll share with you how that works. But I want you to take these four questions and actually lean into them for at least 15 or 30 minutes, maybe tonight, maybe sometime this week. This is a halftime exercise, and these four questions combined with the presence of your heavenly father and your savior, I think can help us take a great step toward the second half of the year. Now, the cool thing about these four questions is they aren't questions that I came up with. They're actually in, I think, based on a verse or several verses in the, the, the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is a really interesting book. We're not quite sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. I, I personally think it had to be the apostle Paul. It just seems like his DNA and his wiring and the way he talks but we're not quite sure, but Hebrews chapter 12 is a fantastic halftime speech. And in this, ver in this collection of verses, we're gonna give you these four questions. So today's kind of a tag team approach. I'm gonna go first, I'm gonna tee up these questions, then we're literally gonna give these questions to you and ask you to process these questions and then come back next Sunday with what I believe will be, we're gonna talk about one adjustment that could make all the difference. Now, so here's what I wanna do. We're, in essence, when it comes to Hebrews chapter 12, we're actually, it's as if we walked in a little late to the inspiring locker room halftime speech. So we walk up and we lean into the locker room, we get into the locker room and here's what we hear. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, which means that there's a part of this conversation that we have not heard yet. So before we go any further and find out what these four questions are that you and I are gonna process through, this week, I wanna go back. I wanna go back. What does this mean that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses? And I just wanna keep this on the screen and I wanna go back to the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is one of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. It's been described as the hall of fame of faith. It's not an exhaustive list of names, but it's, it's, a, it's a who's who in many respects. It's kind of like we have the College Football Hall of Fame here in Atlanta. This is the Hall of Fame of Faith. Not an exhaustive list, but some pretty significant names. 
And so when the writer of Hebrews says, hey, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, I wanted you to see who this is that he's referring to, what it is that we can learn from them, and why this is important for us at the halfway part of the year. So I just wanna give you a few highlights. This is on the screen. I'm just gonna read the whole thing, just a few of the highlights of Hebrews chapter 11. Interestingly enough, and actually in Hebrews chapter 10, the last verse, it says this, which I think is important as well. It says, but we are not of those who shrink back. I love that. He's in essence saying, hey, you got punched in the face by life this year. You got knocked down. Well, we're not those who stay down. We're not those who shrink back from the challenges. Oh no, we are like those who get up. This is what he says. We are those who believe. And we are a group of people who have faith that we can take the changes and the challenges and turn them into positive change for our good, for the good of the people in our lives and for the glory of God. We are not like those who shrink back and stay down. We get up, dust ourselves up, dust ourselves off and move forward. And then he uses this word that he says over and over again. We move forward in faith and by faith. And this next verse, his opening line in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, one of the most famous Bible verses of them all. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That we can do this through God's power. We may not see all the marbles over here, but we know how by by the faith and the power of God that we can get here. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Then verse six, he says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then he begins to try to point us to our spiritual DNA, our spiritual heritage of brothers and sisters who face plenty of challenges. In fact, with all due respect to you and me, some of their challenges were far more serious than the ones you and I face. Not downplaying the challenges that you and I face, but their challenges were incredibly significant, life-threatening. And so he begins to say these names, but he couches and presents all these with two words. It's important. By faith, Noah. And he tells Noah's story. By faith, Abraham. And he tells Abraham's story. How Abraham overcame challenges to see positive results in his life and for you and me. And then he goes on this riff and I'll I'll read some of this. He says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, Moses kept the Passover. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient, which is important because we find out Rahab, the prostitute, is actually part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, which is a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. But what Rahab didn't know at that moment is her faith, what hung in the balance of her by faith moment. And then he goes on to say, hey, I don't even have time to tell you all these others. I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle. And you hear all this and you think, Jeff, why is this important to me? Because these are your spiritual brothers and sisters. They are a great cloud of witnesses to say, hey, before you are some challenges, but before us were some significant challenges as well. But by faith, we didn't stay down on the canvas. By faith, we didn't get punched in the face by life and go, well, I guess that's how this play, this play of my life is going to play out. No, we got up and we moved forward because we are people who don't shrink back. We get up off the canvas and we move forward. So if you come into the halftime of the year and you would say, Jeff, I don't have a whole lot of marbles over here. Hey, that's okay. It's not too late to finish strong. It's only halftime. 
And you have got this spiritual DNA running through your soul. Not just that, the same God that walked with all of these people, this great cloud of witnesses, is the same God who is here with us today. And so the writer is on this big, inspiring halftime speech, and he goes, now, having said all of that in Hebrews chapter 11, therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by their example and surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, here's our action item going forward. And this is what he says, and this is gonna lead us to these four questions this week. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Now, I think this is really important, Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, that these two things are separated. So in studying this and in praying through this and preparing for our time together today, I began to ask, well, what's the difference here? What are things that hinder and what are things that entangle, right? And I think they're two different things. There's similarities, but I think it's helpful to know that they're actually two different things. So the first one I think is really, really important, okay? I, I would think in terms of everything that hinders, I think things that hinders are habits, right? Hinders equals habits. So a great question for us to ask and process through are what are some of the habits that are preventing me from being where I want to be at the second half of the year? What are some of the habits that I am employing in my life right now that are preventing me from doing this? They're preventing me from taking this one positive step day in and day out. What has stopped me from doing this? Again, I hate to keep bringing this up, but you know, exercise or health is a good thing. You know, eating Cinnabot at 10 o'clock at night, not a good habit to consistently employ, right? Um, going to the mall on a consistent basis or amazon.com or wherever, when you're trying to get out of debt, you probably don't want to go there on a consistent basis. That might be a habit that is hindering you. But what's, ha- what's challenging about all this is that you have to be emotionally aware of how these habits are impacting you. And many times we're not aware of how these habits are impacting us. It's why we need to get a second or third opinion. But not only that, there's a, you have to understand not only the habits that hinder us, we have to understand the things that entangle us. So if there are habits that are hindering you, and we're gonna talk about that in just a second, we also have to know the things that entangle us. So what's the difference between hinders and habits and things that entangle us? Entangle us? Well, I think sin equals thoughts. Like what hinders us is our habits, but what entangles us is our thought life. That's what the scriptures actually teach when it comes to sin. Sin is just simply missing the mark. God wants you to be this kind of man or this kind of woman for your good and his glory. We miss the mark. That's sin. But the Bible teaches that where sin starts isn't typically in an action. Where sin begins is right here in my brain. And one of the things that you and I have to be aware of, and this is so hard to do, is to figure out where is our thought life leading us? Now, I'll just be honest with you, and especially for Gwinnett Church, this may be disappointing with you, but typically when I wake up, when my feet hit the ground, I don't, the first thing I I don't necessarily do is start singing Gwinnett worship songs or, you know, or just praising God. I'm kind of groggy and I kind of strap on all the weight and stress and the pressures of the world, all right? And if I'm not careful, I can march into the day with all of that on me. So what I have to do is just wake up and figure out how am I feeling and what am I thinking of today? And by just writing this down and saying, God, my thoughts right now are all about stress. God, my thoughts right now are all about worry. God, my thoughts right now are all about envy. Just actually seeing that on a piece of paper helps me understand where my brain is because my brain can lead my heart, which lead my actions. Now, Typically, as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to see this in the mirror. It's why you need to have a vast amount of emotional awareness about yourself. But the reality is, is we don't have as much emotional awareness about ourselves as we probably need to. This is why you need to have a group of people around you that are saying, hey, I see some habits in you that aren't that great. I see some thoughts that are leading to actions which aren't that great, and they're not leading you to be the kind of man and woman that God's calling you to be. And when they do that, we have to listen to them. 
I'll give you an example. Four years ago, when we were building this building here at Gwinnett Church, Sugar Hill, and if you've ever built anything, you know, you have building delays and all that kind of stuff. And then if you're a nonprofit, you gotta raise money and there's all that. And it was great, it was wonderful. But after we moved in here, it was exhausting, it was wonderful, it was a good tire, but it was exhausting. And a few months after moving in here, I was approached by my wife, Wendy, and Lauren Espy, and Andy Stanley, maybe you've heard of him, and a few others. And they said, hey, we, we think you're, you're on the edge of burnout. We think we're seeing signs that, that you're getting really, really tired. And so what we've come to tell you is we want you to take a few days off and simply rest and try to recalibrate because we're concerned where the burnout may be taking you. Now, that was a gift to me. So let me push this a little bit. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I think you're drinking a little bit too much. Hey, I, I think your, your, your online habits aren't where it needs to be. Rather than be defensive, we need to understand that they're maybe seeing us in a way that we can't see us, and they had the courage to tell us that, and it is an extraordinary, helpful gift. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, leads us to a couple of these two, first two questions that we're gonna process this week. The first question is, what habits, what habits are hindering you? And what thoughts are entangling you? So what habits are hindering you? And what thoughts are entangling you? Now, this, again, this is really practical and very helpful. And let me say this. This isn't a diatribe against social media today, okay? I'm not saying that. But this sometimes is where that negatively plays in. I'll give you a positive example. So my son Cole is a rising senior at, at North Gwinnett. And, and typically, I'll, I'll show him somebody on Instagram. I say, hey, do you, an athlete, do you see this guy, what he did? Or this, see what this, what this uh, female athlete did? This was awesome. This was great. So a few weeks ago, I said, hey, man, did you see what this guy did in the NBA? This is what he did in the community. It was awesome. And Cole said, uh, I'm not on Instagram. I'm taking an Instagram break. And I'm like, well, well okay. Well, why are you taking an Instagram break? He goes, well... I've just began to notice that when I'm on Instagram, I began to be envious of where my friends maybe are on vacation or I you know, see things that maybe I shouldn't see and things that come up and I'm just like, I don't think this right now is leading me to be the man I ultimately want to be. So I'm taking a break on Instagram, dad. <laughs> wow, that was very convicting, okay? And what he was saying is, hey, there's some habits and there that, that I think are hindering me, and there are some thoughts that are entangling me, and to have that kind of emotional awareness is incredibly important, but it's helpful to have that because one of the things Cole has over at Inside Out is a great group of small group leaders and a great small group that says, hey man, let's be the men God's calling us to be. Now, if this was just it, Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, that would be good. This is, this is how rich the Bible is. We're not even out of the first verse, all right? But he continues, and I love these next four words. He says, and let us run, all right? Now, these four words I love. Let me tell you two of the four words I love. The first one is this word run, all right? He's not saying, oh, this is a walk in the park. Uh, let's, and let us walk, let us skip, let us jog. No, he's saying, let us run. This is gonna be hard work. This won't be easy. But here's what I tell the team at our church. Good news is, we didn't sign up for easy. We signed up for worthwhile. No one wants to get to the end of their life and go, you know what, I'm so glad this vapor called life was so easy. It didn't cost me anything. I didn't really dream much. I didn't really do much. It was so easy. No one wants that kind of life. Your heavenly father certainly doesn't want that for you and he just certainly deserves better. So let us run. Yes, what this looks like, this is a lot of hard work and it requires faith to do this. It requires faith to get to the end of the year looking like this. Let us run. It's gonna take some hard work, but it's worth it. And then this word here, us. Who's your squad? Who's your people? Who is sharpening you? Iron sharpens iron. Who is sharpening you? Who are you listening to? Let me talk to the students in the room. Students, this is true for us adults as well, by the way. Who you listen to is a preview of the future you. Are you liking what you're hearing out of their life? And if not, 
and you're listening to them and going in their direction, they are a preview of the future you. So let's get a group of people. That's why we have at all of our campuses in August, we either call, some campuses call it group launch. Some campuses call it group link. But in essence, what it's to do is just to get us into a small group. So that small group, we can run together. And how are we running? Well, that's how the rest of this verse plays out. And let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. You have a race marked out for you. It's called the second half of the year. So let's run this second half of the year with endurance. And as we do, let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So as we look at this verse here, fixing our eyes on Jesus it leads us to a really important question as we talk about reflecting on the first half of the year in order to prepare for the second half of the year. And that's this question. Where did you fix your eyes in the first half of this year? Where did you fix your eyes in the first half of this year? And if we're going to have a halftime adjustment, what this means is we're gonna have to have a vision adjustment. And please understand, I'm not saying this is wrong, but if we spent a lot of time on Netflix in the first half of the year, we might need to make a halftime adjustment and spend less time looking there and more time looking at Jesus. And we're gonna talk about specifically how to do that today in the next couple of weeks. But the reason this is important is when we stop looking at so many other things and reduce our field of vision, something really powerful happens. In fact, this is a military example. When they they say when you go on reconnaissance missions, if you're just scanning, trying to find something or someone, rather than just scan and look all over the place, here's what they say. Reduce your field of vision. Just look really, really focused. If you reduce your field of vision, you'll actually see more. And I think what the, the writer is saying is, hey, if you'll reduce your field of vision to Jesus, instead of looking at what else, what else is going on in everyone else's life and all these other things. Not saying you shouldn't do that from time to time. Not saying that's evil or wrong, but can we reduce our field of vision to, get our, to fix our eyes on Jesus more consistently in the second half of the year? And not only that, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, something really, really important happens. And that leads us to the next verse because this is what Jesus did and it's a model for us. And it said, he did this, for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And what this means is what Jesus did is he looked to the joy that set before him. And you know what the joy set before him is? Specifically, do you know who the joy set before him is? That's you. What Jesus saw wasn't just the cross. He saw you and he made his way to you by going through the cross. And that allowed him to endure the scorn and the pain of the change. And this is important for us to know because when it comes to the change that we want in the second half, we're gonna have to adjust our vision from the pain of the change to the joy the change will bring. Yeah, this is gonna be painful to do this, but we've got to look at the joy that the change will bring for the joy set before you. And again, here's why this is important. Jesus didn't look to the cross. Jesus looked through the cross to the joy set before him, which was you, me, and the glory of his father. So when it comes to the second half of the year, I know this this can look painful, but don't look to the change. Look through to the change, to the joy that change will bring. Don't look to the change. Look through the change to the joy it will bring. This is why I love the Dave Ramsey debt-free screams. I love that because you know what these folks did? They knew that eating rice and beans for six months and not going on a vacation for so long and cutting up their credit cards, all of that was painful, but they looked through that to standing there, looking through the window. Dave counts them down. He plays the Braveheart theme music and they all scream, I am debt free. And everybody goes crazy. They looked in that moment, the joy set before them, allowed them to consistently just do this. We're gonna eat rice and beans. 
We're not going to spend money on our credit card. We're going to take consistent steps day in and day out. And eventually they got to this point and they screamed, we are debt free. To get here, you have to look through the change to the joy set before you. So what is the joy that you want to get to the end of the year and experience? And if you don't know, hey, good news is that's okay. It's only halftime. We're going to figure that out. And so that leads me to your assignment, if you will, this week, this part of your sermon that you're going to hopefully do tonight or sometime this week. There are four questions and we're going to give you these four questions. All of this comes Good news is, great news actually, this doesn't come from me, this comes from the writer, from our Heavenly Father to the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and three. We're gonna give you this card uh, on your way out. You're gonna get this on social media as well, but here's the questions we want you to process through. First, what habit is hindering me that I need to change? Okay, what habit is hindering you that you need to change? And again, these are great questions to get some feedback. I would encourage you not just to go through this on your own, but to get some feedback from your small group or some friends or your, or your family. What habit is hindering me that I need to change? Second question, what thought is entangling me that I need to adjust? What thought about me is just not leading me to the kind of person I want to be? And then this third one is what we just talked about. Um, what joy would this change bring me by the end of the year? This is a great question because of what we learn by fixing our eyes on Jesus for the joy set before him. And if you and I can't articulate the joy of what we want to get to and experience by the end of the year, it's going to be hard when the challenges come our way. So the more specific you are about the joy you want to experience by the end of the year or the steps that you will take to get to the end of the year, it will help you fight through the times when you just want to stop putting marbles over here. And then the fourth question might be the most important one today. How can I fix my eyes on Jesus? How can I fix today? An important important word there, today. How can I fix my eyes on Jesus? By the way, cool news for everybody here today, you've already done it. Church attendance is really important. It's a spiritual growth. I think it's a factor in our spiritual growth. So today you got away from the busyness of life and you fixed your eyes on Jesus. And so here's how this is gonna look. As I mentioned earlier, you're gonna get this on your way out. You can download this on, your, on social media, but I wanna encourage you to take at least 15 to 30 minutes, process through this. And then what we're gonna do is come back next Sunday and take a significant step toward one of the most important things that you have in your life, that I have in my life, that if we'll make an adjustment with this one thing based on these questions, it will make a significant, significant difference. But that's next Sunday. Before then, we've got some work to do. So before we get there, I have a question for you. And then we're going to pray over you through a song that I think helps lead and usher us in to the second half of the year. And the question is this, what if, what if we pretended that July was January? Remember January, you know, this is my year and we're going to make it. I got all these things and nobody thinks of second half New Year's resolutions. But what if we did? What if we pretended that July was January and we thought, you know what? The same kind of thinking, the same kind of dreaming, the same kind of faith, the same kind of hoping. What if we did that in July? And the reason this is important is this, this truth. You and I, we don't have January any longer, but we do have July. And more importantly, we do have Jesus to walk with us. So how was your first half? There are probably some good things that happened. There are probably some challenging things that happened. That's a part of life. But now here we are at halftime. And I think what your heavenly father wants to whisper to you is, hey, it's not too late. It's not too late to make that change. It's not too late to take that step. It's not too late to grow in that particular area. Hey, it may take longer than December. But let's get to December strong because right now it's only halftime. It's not too late to finish strong. So here's what our team wants to do at all of our churches today. We want to just sing a song of prayer over you. And this song in essence talks about the fact that change isn't easy, but hey, that's why we have faith. 
And faith isn't this fragile thing that when we bump into the reality of life and as life punches us in the face and knocks us down, faith isn't something that's fragile that just is shattered. No, 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 no. We're not those kind of people. We're not people that shrink back. We're not people that stay down. We are people that get up and move forward. And this prayer, this song will say, hey, into faith, (laughs) into faith, into faith, we're gonna take a step today and this week toward what God has for us in the second half of the year. Because I think God has great plans for you. I believe God has great plans for all of us. And I'm hoping and believing God has great plans for me. And so let's leverage this season of a halftime to get ready to experience those plans. Because God is for you, God is with you, God loves you. So Father, knowing that today and knowing that we're on the verge of the second half, I just wanna pray for this moment as we sing this prayer over our churches today. Thank you for what's happening in so many different cities that are watching today. And I pray, but specifically for the individuals that are watching this. And God, this song leads us to the second half and it leads us to the questions. And I'm praying for the moment that we all sit down and process through these questions. Can you do, and I know you will, will you do what only you can do, which is to speak to us, to change us, to prompt us, to bring something in us, to encourage us, to challenge us and convict us so that we can get ready to come back next Sunday and speak again to us in one of the most significant ways and changes that we can make. I do pray for next Sunday and what's going to happen there. But before we get there, speak over us in these words, in this song, in this prayer. And we're grateful for what you're gonna do. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name, amen.
Church, we're so thankful for this time with you. We're so thankful for today. Is anybody believing great things for this week, for the rest of this year? We're gonna keep the momentum going next Sunday. We love you guys. We hope you have an incredible week. We'll see you next week.